Yesterday's video where I talked about some of my issues with inadequacy and the fears that were still holding me back, it was a pretty brutal one. And at about the same time as I made that video, I posted a topic on my favorite trans forum where, you know, I pretty much complained about the same things. And in that topic, I completely ripped into myself. I mean, I called, some of the names that I called myself, here's part of the list. I called myself selfish. I called myself uncaring. I called myself a loser, an inadequate human being, a screw-up, lazy, a failure as a son, a failure as a significant other, and a failure as a trans woman. And those thoughts, unfortunately, were quite genuine at the time. And the first person to respond told me, Carrie, she said, I don't even know how to respond to this because you were just so brutal to yourself. I mean, and, you know, she said, P possibly the problem isn't that you are feeling so inadequate, but the problem is that these feelings of inadequacy are coming from your own self-criticism. And, you know, it got me thinking. And I realized I really do have a problem with self-criticism. I don't give myself a break, ever. And this has been going on for quite a long time. Ever since I was in school is when it got started. And I think part of, so in this video I just kind of want to talk about that, the history of my self-criticism and, you know, just how bad it's been over the years. So basically where it started, I believe, was just because I've always scored in like the top 1% of every aptitude test that I've ever taken. Like, you know, normally the test takers will give them to you and then say, well, you're good in math, but, you know, you could improve in this, and, you know, you're average in this. When I took it, I was at the top of every single field. The test taker actually told my mom I didn't have any weaknesses. And so, from a very young age, the expectations on me to take those brains and actually turn them into success were just astronomically high. I can't tell you how many times I've been told if I had your brains, I would may, I would change the world, I swear, and, you know, because of that, I just ha have always had this tremendous pressure on me to succeed, and unfortunately, at every single turn, I have not succeeded. I have, especially in high school and early college, it took me seven years to get through college, and in high school, I failed classes. In both cases, I had to take summer classes just to graduate because, you know, I just had such a hard time getting through them. And, you know, this is kind of, you know, it just, it, when a normal kid gets straight A's, you know, their parents are so happy for them. They're like, oh, you, you've worked so hard. And, you know, I can't imagine how much effort it must have taken you to get those grades. Where, with me, because... I was so able to get A's on things without any effort whatsoever because of my abilities. Anything less than an A felt like a failure. And, you know, my dad was kind of one of those people who didn't really ever compliment me on stuff. He, oh, if I got a 98%, he'd say, all right, well, these are the two questions that you missed. Let's go over them so you don't miss them next time. And, you know, I believe it was well-intentioned, but it also kind of, you know, gave me this internalized stigma that, you know, what I was doing was never good enough unless it was absolutely perfect. And so, unfortunately, where that really started getting out of hand was when my gender dysphoria got mixed into it. One of the reasons why I'm realizing I waited so long is because due to this perfection complex, I refused to admit that I had gender dysphoria for so many years because, again, it was like this judgment on me that said that I wasn't perfect. Every single second of my life, it reminded me that I was something less, that I wasn't normal. And so 
I just put so much effort into crushing those thoughts, into getting them out of my head and saying, no, I'm better than this, and unfortunately to my own destruction, um, to the point where I let it destroy my life, basically, to the point where I felt so bad about myself, so guilty, not only because you know, I had this secret that I had to suppress, but also because of these high expectations. Because, because it was affecting my life, and because it was making my grades so bad, I hated myself for that. So I already hated myself for, you know, the gender dysphoria and the normal things that come with that, but then I also hated myself because it impacted my success, and so, you know, suddenly there just got to be this unbelievable stigma attached to my schoolwork where it got to the point where every single time I got a homework assignment, as soon as I received it, I would be dreading it because I knew that I wasn't going to feel like doing it and it probably wasn't going to be done and I was going to rush through it at the last minute and I was going to feel horrible the whole time because I just feel like, you know, I'm not supposed to be going through this. I'm supposed to be perfect. I'm supposed to get this stuff done immediately and I could get it done like that and I get straight A's no problem, so why am I such a miserable failure? And those feelings just followed me all the way through high school, all the way through college. They had their culmination when, in the year 2007, I tried to become a fundamentalist Christian and pray away my transsexual desires. And the Christianity, unfortunately, just fed into this angry, judgmental voice that I always had over me that was constantly reminding me that I was less than perfect. And, you know, that's what the voice of God became to me. It became this judgmental voice coming from above, reminding me of all of the ways that I'd screwed up and all of the ways that I should be better. And I was going to a Baptist church, so, you know, their whole thing is about how we are so much better than these other heathens in the rest of the world because we have the law of God and we are not supposed to spend all of our time watching TV and we are not supposed to have all of these emotional issues because God has cured us. And so suddenly every single imperfection in my life became a threat to me, something that I had to eradicate. And I suppose I should have guessed that something was wrong when, as a religion major, one day I was missing class. You know, it got to the point where I couldn't even get out of bed to go to class because I just felt so bad on a fundamental level. And I, one day I went into my religion professor's office and basically had to grovel at his feet to ask for forgiveness so that I could still pass the class. And all of a sudden, my heart just came pouring out. And, you know, he just looked so sad in his eyes as he asked me, when you don't do your homework, do you see it as a sin? And I said, yes. And, you know, I just felt like such a failure in everything. And... You know, he basically said, you're holding yourself to too high of a standard. You know, God isn't this judgmental voice that's, you know, constantly telling you how bad of a person you are. He's the opposite. He's the one that, despite how bad of a person you may be, still loves you and still forgives you. And yet I was seeing him as the opposite. And so now here I am, and now this same self-hatred is spilling out into transition once again. And, you know, the transition kind of fuels it because I still feel bad about myself on a fundamental level. So once again, I'm just expecting this perfection from myself. And all the compliments that I've received over the last few months where people are telling me that, I, oh, you look pretty, and, you know, I'm constantly surrounded by all these people who went full-time, like, immediately and are already outliving their lives and who at the same stage of hormones as I am were completely passable. So now the weight of those expectations once again are hitting me hard and I'm just constantly drilling into myself with all of these things about how I'm a failure and how, you know, I should be further along and all these expectations that are coming from no one that tell me that I should be full-time right now, and I should be outliving my life. And 
I let it happen because I've just become so self-critical over the years. So I think this may be what's behind a significant portion of my problems and why I always end up breaking down into these emotional fits because I feel like I'm failing and because I'm letting other people's expectations get to me so much. So, you know, some advice maybe on how to be less self-critical, on how to give myself the leeway to be myself without expecting so much of myself. And, you know, that would be appreciated. And, again, thank you for listening. I'm definitely on a huge voyage of self-discovery here in terms of having to confront headlong all of these things that I've been running from for my entire life and all these things that I take for granted. And again, you know, I think the reason why it took me so long to transition was just because of that self-critical voice in my head. So it's taken me going down this path to finally start coming to terms with who I am and really confronting it. And I'm not liking everything that I find, I'll admit, but, you know, one thing that I can say about transition is it kind of forces you to come face to face with a flawed self that will probably never be perfect. And for the first time, I'm kind of having to accept that. So, fingers crossed it'll work out, but I will learn to be less self-critical and, you know, I'll let myself be more patient and hopefully eventually I'll get to full time and where once there was just a shattered, self-critical, miserable self that never cut myself a break, that hated myself every single time I looked in the mirror, to maybe finally being someone who can turn that critical voice off and say, I like myself. I hope I can get there. Thanks for listening. Bye.